The deputy FBI director resigns. President Trump gives his State of the Union address tonight. Oh, happy, happy day. And we'll talk about the release of the memo and the Kraken. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Lots of news to get to today. I will also have some thoughts on Black Panther. I haven't seen it yet, but I just have a feeling that it will be the greatest movie ever and that critics will love it more than any movie has ever been loved by anyone at any time at any place in history. I think it's just going to be that good. Or maybe it won't and we'll never find out about it. That's possible as well. We'll talk about a lot of that sort of stuff in deconstructing the culture a little bit later in the show. But before we get to any of the myriad topics upon which we must opine, first, I want to say thank you to our sponsors over at Policy Genius. So every year, 30% of people make a resolution to be more financially responsible. And then those people don't do anything. Well, don't be one of those people. Make that resolution and then go out and make sure that you are covered for life insurance. Because here's the fact. If you plot tomorrow, your family is going to be without money. Okay, that is not responsible planning. You want to make sure that your family is fine if you plot. I mean, aside from the emotional loss of you plotting. They shouldn't have to deal with the financial fallout. And that's why you need to go over to my friends over at Policy Genius. It's the easy way to compare and buy life insurance online. They let you compare quotes in just five minutes. And they don't just insure life, they insure everything. They compare health insurance, disability insurance, pet insurance, renter's insurance. There are lots of ways to be responsible, and Policy Genius allows you to do that at the most effective possible price. So if you made a New Year's resolution to be more financially responsible, do it right now. Like, really, right now, just pause the podcast, go over to Policy Genius, and then get your life insurance. And then when you come back and you're shocked by the news and have a heart attack, no one will care because your family will be paid. It'll be fine. Okay, so policygenius.com, it's the easy way to compare and buy life insurance. Again, it's free. Policy Genius, get your New Year's resolution resolved in five minutes over at policygenius.com. All right, so we begin today with the firing or ousting of Andrew McCabe. So there was a lot of talk over the last year and a half about Andrew McCabe. Andrew McCabe was the deputy FBI director. He worked under FBI director James Comey. And then for a short period of time, he was the interim FBI director before Christopher Wray was appointed to head that, to head that organization. Well, yesterday, Andrew McCabe finally stepped down from his position. It was unclear, there was a lot of talk about whether he was ousted or whether he stepped down voluntarily, whether he had been basically told that it's going to be your brains, your signature on this piece of paper, or whether he just decided, I've had enough of President Trump making fun of me, and I'm leaving. So here is what, I believe it's Guy Benson over at, uh, over at Town Hall writes. He says, as you already know, FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe, against whom the president has fulminated in tweets, is no longer occupying his position. CNN's Jim Acosta reported the departure was mutual and done on McCabe's terms, but a lot of other networks are now confirming that McCabe had been ousted. So why did that happen? Well, there are a few different explanations. First off, the McCabe, just he's a month and a half away from his announced retirement, and he decided that he had enough accrued time off to, to leave. So that's, that's possibility number one. Possibility number two is that there's an IG report, an inspector general report, on the Justice Department's handling of the, of the Hillary Clinton email probe, and that there's a bunch of stuff in there that makes Andrew McCabe look really bad. So there's a Fox producer who, who, who tweeted, quote, breaking McCabe out at FBI. Source familiar says that in advance of the IG report, McCabe was told to begin what is referred to as a terminal leave. So basically, there's a bunch of bad news that was going to come out about Andrew McCabe and how corrupt he was, and so he got out now. Now, this is a possibility. Remember, Andrew McCabe's wife and was running for a state Senate seat in Virginia, and the Clinton-connected governor of Virginia, Terry McAuliffe, had a political action committee, and that political action committee uh, directed something like $700,000 to McCabe's wife. So that's a pretty good indicator of where McCabe is politically, because it's very rare that you have a political mixed marriage. And there's a lot of talk inside the FBI as well that McCabe should have stepped aside in the middle of the Hillary email investigation. He did not. He waited until a full week, only a week, before this all happened, before, before the election happened, and then he stepped down. And so there was talk inside the FBI. It was in texts that have now been uncovered, in which it was pretty clear that higher-ups at the FBI could not understand why McCabe had not stepped away from the Clinton investigation. Okay, another possibility is that the FBI Director Christopher Wray has now read the infamous Russia memo compiled by the House Intelligence Committee Republicans. That committee is voting, and they voted yesterday, to release the memo. So it's possible whether Chris Ray over at the FBI saw something in the House Intelligence memo that said to him that McCabe was guilty of something. And so he went to McCabe and said, listen, you need to step down. You need to step down. So it's possible that there's something about McCabe in there. And there are people who have been leaking about what exactly is in this memo. President Trump, we'll discuss the memo in, in just a few minutes here. President Trump, it's now on his desk for consideration whether he wants to release this House Intelligence Committee memo that supposedly details all sorts of Intelligence Committee misbehavior and, uh, and bad behavior. And Trump can release that, but a lot of the details have started leaking out. 
Well, uh, according to Guy Benson, elements have started leaking, including that Trump appointed Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein approved an extension of surveillance on former Trump campaign aide Carter Page, who had been suspected of malfeasance vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. Now, it is quite possible that Carter Page was being surveilled for good reason. The guy was basically running around Russia asking for someone to pay him, allegedly. And Page was reportedly under FISA surveillance back in 2014. But it's a possibility that McCabe was involved in the, in the Get Carter Page routine because Carter Page was a Trump staffer. So we'll have, to, we'll have to find out. The New York Times is reporting, by the way, that the FBI director, Christopher Wray, found something concerning in the IG report, and he was going to move McCabe into another job, which was effectively a demotion. Instead, McCabe decided to leave the FBI. So it looks like it has nothing to do with the House Intelligence memo, although we won't know until the House Intelligence memo has actually been revealed. Bottom line is that McCabe, it sounds like, left for good reason. It doesn't sound like this was Trump firing Andrew McCabe. Why would he bother firing Andrew McCabe a month before McCabe is going to leave anyway? Now, a lot of people on the left saying, oh, this is obstruction of justice. Oh, it's, it's a slow motion Saturday Night Massacre. Chris Matthews, you know, I was like, say. He came out, he said, you know what? Looks just like Nixon. You know, he, he leaves, this McCabe guy. He was protecting us. He's going to stand up to Trump, Russia collusion, Putin. I roll out of bed, come out of this show, come here and talk about Russia. Slow motion, Saturday Night Massacre, go. I said earlier today that, Mc, that Andrew McCabe should not be replaced with somebody who's just a presidential stooge and who's going to help kill this investigation. Because there are already plenty of people around here, quite honestly, who are just doing the bidding of the president over conducting a thorough and fair investigation. It and looks to me like that's a, where we are now. A, a congressman, I mean, you're young, too young to have seen it, but it looks like a slow motion Saturday night massacre. One by one, Comey, McCabe, and now Rosenstein in, targets, in the target zone. No, you're right. Uh, look, I was born uh, shortly before uh, the president resigned in 1974. And there are a lot of comparisons and parallels to the Nixon years, except at that time, you actually had a Congress of a different party that was a kind of check on the president doing a thorough investigation here, there's a real question whether that's going on. Okay, so that obviously is not the case. Okay, the idea that this is a Saturday Night Massacre. Saturday Night Massacre, if you recall, back to 1974, is when there was a special in council investigation into, Nick, into Watergate. And Richard Nixon ordered Archibald Cox, who was then the attorney general, to, to he ordered, I'm sorry, Archibald Cox was the special prosecutor, and he ordered the attorney general to fire the special prosecutor. The attorney general refused, and then he fired the attorney general and the special prosecutor by appointing a new attorney general who would fire the special prosecutor. That's what the Saturday Night Massacre was. McCabe was not fired here, really. He was told by the head of the FBI, there's some bad stuff about you, and then he resigned. He's keeping his pension. He's going to fill out his term. Okay, no one has been fired here except for James Comey. And Comey, of course, goes out and tweets self-righteously. What's amazing is that people are treating James Comey as though he's some sort of great halcyon of truth. I was open to the idea that James Comey was a truth teller because his reputation was pretty good before the last year and a half. But now all James Comey does on Twitter is literally quote himself. He literally did this the other day. He actually quoted himself and then he wrote this quote and then he said, me. Right? He actually attributed it to me. Okay, James Comey is the most self-serving guy in American politics in a position where he ought not be self-serving. You know, President Trump was not wrong to call him a grandstander because it's pretty clear that's what's happening here. So Comey, who's now on Twitter, he says, Special Agent Andrew McCabe stood tall over the last eight months when small people were trying to tear down an institution we all depend on. He served with distinction for two decades. I wish Andy well. I also wish continued strength for the rest of the FBI. America needs you. Now listen, I think that America does need the FBI, but James Comey is largely responsible for tearing down the credibility of the FBI. It was James Comey who was responsible for using the FBI as a political tool to protect President Obama and Hillary Clinton. Now, is that an excuse for Republicans to be doing what they've been doing about the FBI? I, I'm not sure that it is. We're going to have to see the contents of this much ballyhooed House intelligence memo, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. But the idea that James Comey has anything to say here or that the FBI was squeaky clean during the Hillary investigation or that Andrew McCabe shouldn't have recused himself or that Comey gets to stand there and talk about honesty in the FBI after legitimately changing the law on the fly in order to exonerate Hillary Clinton and let Loretta Lynch, then the Attorney General of the United States, off the hook. All of that is a bunch of nonsense. All that's a bunch of nonsense. So before everybody starts going off on the, oh, McCabe was fired, it's the Saturday Night Massacre, no, that's not what's happening at all. Let's look at the facts, and then we can analyze. Okay, so we're going to get into Memo Fight 2018. It's the greatest MMA bout of the century. We'll get into that in just one second. But first, I want to say thank you to our sponsors over at Wink. So if you're like me trying to follow all of these scandals day by day, and you're trying to follow the narrative, and you think that you might need a drink, 
Okay, that's why you need to go to my friends over at Wink. So what Wink is really great for is you're going to a dinner party, you don't know anything about wine, you want to bring a, a bottle of wine that's just going to astonish everyone, and you don't know a bottle of wine from dishwasher detergent. You just don't know anything about wine. Well, that's what TryWink is for. So you go to trywink.com slash Ben, and they have this great algorithm where they ask you, it's a palette profile quiz, they ask you simple questions you know, that, that people would never be able to translate into a wine recommendation, like how do you like your coffee? How do you feel about blueberries? And then they send a wine that is curated to your taste. The more wines you rate, the more personalized your monthly selection. Each month, there are fantastic new wines. People at our office love Link. They, we, we had a wine tasting party here at the office, and uh, people got smashed because that's what they do on a regular day. But here, they actually enjoyed the liquor. They weren't just drinking turpentine. Go to trywink.com slash Ben. It's trywink.com slash Ben. You get $20 off your first shipment. That's T-R-Y-W-I-N-C.com slash Ben for 20 bucks off. Trywink.com slash Ben. Check it out. And again, this is the best way to, to purchase wine, not only for yourself, but also for those dinner parties where you just don't know what to bring. Trywink.com slash Ben. also makes for a, a great gift for Valentine's Day, which is coming up very shortly here. So, okay, so, meanwhile, Memo Fight 2018. It's the, the rumble in the jungle. It's the duel at the palace. It's just going to be incredible. So Memo Fight, which sounds just about as boring as it is, that is all about this House Intelligence memo. So I looked it up last night. Devin Nunez's name is pronounced Nunez. It's not pronounced Nunez. It's not pronounced Nunes. Okay, so just so that we're clear, Devin Nunez is the head of the House Intelligence Committee. And Devin Nunez, who's a Republican representative from California, put together this House Intelligence Committee memo. It's a four-page memo that supposedly lays out all of the malfeasance pursued by the, by the intelligence community in the Trump-Russia collusion case and the Hillary Clinton case. So as you recall, there was a big movement to release the memo. So in order to release the memo to the public, they would actually have to vote in the House Intelligence Committee to release it to the public. Then the President of the United States has five days to look at it and determine whether or not to release it, and whether to release the memo or not. Trump is looking at that right now. So yesterday, the House Intelligence Committee voted along party lines to release the memo. They also did vote to make the, the Democratic memo. Adam Schiff, Democrat, came out with a second memo that was supposed to debunk the Republican memo. And it has to go through a process. First, you actually have to vote to release the memo to the rest of the House. Then you have to vote to release the memo more broadly. They did vote not to release it to the public yesterday, but they voted to release it to the rest of the House so other people can read it. They really should vote to release all of this stuff at once so that we can see as much of it as possible in the, in the fastest possible way. We should also see the underlying materials as, mu as long as those underlying materials don't actually endanger national security. Adam Schiff, of course, was very angry that this House intelligence memo was going to be released to the public. Uh, and he does have a gift. I mean, the man has, a, has the ability to look nonpartisan, even when he's saying deeply partisan things. Here is uh, Adam Schiff. Adam Schiff is a Democrat from California. Uh, we had votes today to politicize the intelligence process, uh, to prohibit the FBI and the Department of Justice from expressing their concerns to our committee and to the House, uh, and to selectively release to the public only the majority's distorted memo without the full facts. Um, a very sad day, I think, uh, in the history of this committee. As I said to my committee colleagues during this hearing, sadly, we can fully expect that the President of the United States will not put the national interest uh, over his own personal interest. But it is a sad day, indeed, when that is also true of our own committee. Okay, so basically, Democrats are making the claim that de Democrats are making the claim that the FBI is squeaky clean, and that any memo that comes out that condemns the FBI is an attack on the FBI. Now. I don't know what's in the memo yet. You don't know what's in the memo yet. No one knows what's in the memo yet. I suspect that there is some stuff in there that's pretty damning of the FBI. And I also suspect that Republicans are out over their skis on this memo, that they are overplaying the memo, that they are suggesting that the memo is going to be the kill shot that takes down the Mueller investigation. If so, I, I don't know why. I think these are two separate issues. It is quite possible that the FISA warrant on Carter Page was originally badly gotten, but that there's more to the investigation. It's also possible that the FBI was badly compromised in the Hillary Clinton investigation, but was not super compromised in the Trump-Russia collusion investigation. Remember, and one of the weird oddities about all this is we're talking about the corruption of the FBI on behalf of Hillary Clinton in the last election cycle, but it was the FBI's constant intervention. It was James Comey's intervention, then non-intervention, then intervention, then non-intervention that probably tossed the election away from Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump. Meanwhile, we didn't hear anything from the FBI for months about the Trump-Russia collusion investigation that was going on. So there's a lot of oddity about all of this. Democrats, I think, are, are posturing. You know, if they suggest that the FBI is completely clean, that the memo is completely made up, and it's all nonsense, and we just want to protect the FBI and national security, the Democrats have spent my entire lifetime attacking the FBI and national security. So I find this a little bit convenient politically. Nancy Pelosi is doing the same thing. She says that she's deeply, deeply angry over the Devin Nunes memo. 
This is a, a very big honor that the leader gives to the ranking member, that the speaker gives to the chairman, uh, to be deputized to protect the intelligence, the intelligence to for force protection of our troops, uh, for uh, sure. uh, fighting terrorism and the rest of that. Instead, Chairman Nunes has acted like a stooge at the, with the speaker. A stooge? A stooge of the White House at the acquiescence or at least or maybe the guidance of the Speaker of the House. This is not about one thing or not. This is about the integrity and the safety and our national security. That's what they, he says, too, though. They have crossed. They have crossed from dangerously and recklessly dealing with intelligence to a cover-up of an investigation that they don't want the American people uh, to see. Come okay, to. and this is this is where I say that Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats have gone off the rails. Okay, where is the cover-up? There's no cover-up. Okay, the Mueller investigation is proceeding apace. The the Nunes memo doesn't have anything to do with the Mueller investigation. I think we need to separate out all these strands. Right now, it feels like we are just in a chaotic windstorm of scandal and innuendo, but. When you separate out all the strands, what you find is many things can be true at once, as I said last week. It is true that the FBI was compromised, badly compromised in the Hillary investigation. It is also true that it's possible that they were compromised at the beginning of the Trump investigation, but not later. We don't know yet. It's possible the House Intelligence memo is an effort to try and get the Mueller investigation by essentially stepping on the FBI. That's possible. I don't know. I haven't seen the memo. What I will say is that I think both sides are deeply overplaying this. So the Democrats are saying the memo, is, like when they act this scared, by the way, it makes it look as though the memo actually has something damaging to say. When they act as though that what, what the Democrats really should be saying is, I don't know why anyone's going so crazy about this memo. It's a biased political document that obviously is an attempt to overturn the, the Mueller investigation or to throw mud on the, on, the, on the skirt of the Mueller investigation. But I don't know why everybody's so hot and bothered about it. It, it should be relatively easy to debunk if you're a Democrat. Right? They should be able to just say, this isn't true, this isn't true, this isn't true, or you're drawing the wrong conclusions from a set of facts. So the Democrats instead are going crazy. Oh, the memo is the worst thing that ever happened. The memo is an attempt to obstruct justice. Nonsense, nonsense. Meanwhile, on the right, you got a bunch of people who are saying the memo is the end of the story. The memo is just, this thing is just so important. This memo, which was indeed composed by a partisan group in the House Intelligence Committee, that this memo is going to be the be-all, end-all. So, so it's the usual suspects who are saying this. So Sean Hannity over on Fox News, he says the Nunes memo is huge. It's enormous. It's gigantic, talking with Janine Pirro. Because this is not a game. We are talking about people's lives. We're talking about potential crimes. We're talking about people being charged, going to jail. But more importantly, and the scary part of this, and, and I'll throw this to Sarah for more information, is that we have now weaponized the powerful tools of intelligence. FISA is important because we can, that means that's our government spying on citizens. And if Hillary's bought and paid for dossier was the foundation to do this, Wow. It was a very shoddy foundation. To influence a presidential election. A duly elected president of the United States voted for by the people of this country. Sean, this is bigger than anything anybody can imagine. And when you and say that, that, this makes Watergate like stealing a Snickers bar from a drugstore. Absolutely, and think about this. Okay, well, this nobody's seen the memo. Stop, stop, stop. Nobody's seen the memo, okay? No one's seen it. It's bigger than Watergate. It makes Watergate look like stealing a Snickers bar. We don't know what's in the memo yet, so can we all just calm down and wait to see what's in the memo? Can we wait to see the underlying documents, right? The DOJ is claiming that Devin Nunes wrote this memo without actually seeing the underlying intelligence. Also, I thought that actually rare point where I'm going to watch this. I'm going to give some credit to Slate. Okay, for all you folks who don't think that I read bipartisan sources, okay, Slate had an article about this, and they made what I thought was actually a relatively decent point. What they said was the, Dem the Republicans are fulminating over FISA warrants being issued against Carter Page, suggesting that the FISA courts are so shoddy that they issued a bad warrant against Carter Page in an attempt to get Trump. They went right along with the FBI. They just rubber stamp whatever comes in front of them. And yet, the same Republicans who are suggesting that the FISA system is so deeply compromised that it was allowed to, to almost subvert the will of the people in an election, those same people voted like two weeks ago to extend FISA authority under Section 702 for another six years without amendment. Right? The same people who are complaining the FISA process is too deeply compromised to allow the American people to feel safe were for extending FISA's authority. So that sounds a little bit hypocritical. I think it's not a terrible argument. Seb Gorka does the same thing on Fox News last night. He says the Nunes memo is 100 times bigger. Than, I mean, you talk about hyperbole. Just watch this hyperbole. This is, this is crazy hyperbole. I don't want to spoil the punchline here. Here's Seb Gorka, uh, former Trump administration staffer, suggesting how big the Nunes memo is. But now the evidence has been mounting and mounting and mounting, and one smoking gun after another. It's incontrovertible at this point. 
It, it is, but it has to be put in the context of the history of our great nation. Remember, why was America created? It was created because of the usurpation of power, the capricious usurpation by a, a leader thousands of miles away. That's why America was created. Um, it was about tea tax. It was about stationing troops on private property without permission. This... This is a hundred times bigger. This is our government spying on political adversaries. This is federal law enforcement officials obstructing justice. Okay, it's the way it's a hundred times worse than the American Revolution. The British literally put British troops in people's private homes. Okay, it's worse. you haven't seen the memo yet. You haven't seen the memo yet. So this is why I think that when Republicans overplay their hand, it makes them look bad. When people like me are saying, "Guys, calm down. Why don't we just wait to see? Can we just wait and see?" then maybe you should wait and see, okay? I am fully open to the idea that the FBI acted badly here, the FBI acted in criminal fashion. I'm fully open to that idea. I'm also open to the idea Republicans are wildly blowing this out of proportion for political purposes. But it seems like nobody from either side is willing to acknowledge the obvious. No one knows what's in the memo outside of Congress. No one knows what's in the underlying intelligence outside of the DOJ and the FBI. So before we all get on our horses and ride to our battlements, perhaps we ought to look at the underlying information. Okay, in just a second, I'm going to talk about Democrats who continue to, to push radicalism on, on a regular basis in Congress. It is pretty astonishing. It's the one thing that's holding up Republicans, I think, in, in, some, of the, in some of the polls. First, I want to say thank you to our sponsors over at Skillshare. So it's January. It means that a lot of you are thinking about your New Year's resolution. Well, one of your New Year's resolutions, if it's not, should have been to increase your skill set. Right? The fact is that you can't expect to stay at a job for 30 years anymore. I, since, since I left law school, I've, I've worked at five or six different jobs, increasing my salary each time. And that's because one of the things I'm committed to is constantly broadening and enriching my skill set. One of the ways I do that is by using Skillshare. It's an online learning platform with over 18,000 classes in design, business, technology, and more. It's one of the ways that you can make sure that your resume is constantly growing, constantly updated, constantly making you more money. I've taken some class on social media marketing. We've taken class on SEO here at The Daily Wire. And right in time for the new year, Skillshare is offering my listeners a limited time offer of three months of Skillshare for just 99 cents. That's three months of Skillshare for just 99 cents. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash Shapiro99. Again, go to Skillshare.com slash Shapiro99. You get three months of Skillshare for just 99 cents. Spectacular deal. Act now for that special New Year's offers. Start learning today. Skillshare.com slash Shapiro99. You get three months of Skillshare for just 99 cents. Go check it out. It's pretty awesome. Okay. So meanwhile, Democrats continue to demonstrate just how radical they are. One of the reasons that the House races are still competitive is because despite all of the chaos surrounding the Trump administration, the Democrats still continue to push some of the most radical policies and rhetoric that I've ever seen uh, in, in modern American history. Kirsten Gillibrand, for example, just makes a fool of herself yesterday. She's talking on The View. I'm still waiting for my invite, guys. I was promised that you were going to consider bringing me on The View because this would be a highlight of my life. But apparently you'll have Kirsten Gillibrand who will just go on there and lie to you openly, repeatedly. She says that chain migration on illegal immigration, chain migration is a racist slur. This is the new Democratic talking point that makes literally no sense since chain migration has nothing to do with slavery and was a term that has been used in legal circles for literally decades. Here's Kirsten Gillibrand suggesting that when you say chain migration, meaning like I come in and then my parents come in and then my cousins come in, like a chain, like a daisy chain, hmm. Not like chains of slaves. God, you people are so stupid. Here she says it's a racial slur. Do you yeah, agree with Nancy Pelosi when she says uh, he wants to make America white again? And that's what this is about? I think a lot of President Trump's rhetoric is racist. And let's be very clear. When someone uses, when someone uses the phrase change migration, when someone uses the phrase change migration, it is intentional in trying to demonize families, literally trying to yeah. demonize families and make it a racist slur. It is not right. And so we have to change the debate. The, these are people, these are families. And as elected leaders, I mean, the way I look at it, I'm going to fight for your child and these children as much as I'm going to fight for my own. And that is our job as elected leaders, to fight for these kids. You got to fight for the kids. Don't you understand? You got to fight for the kids. Yesterday, the Democrats, including Kirsten Gillibrand, voted down a bill that would have prevented abortion, except in cases where the, mother, the life of the mother is in danger. It would have prevented abortion after 20 weeks. 20 weeks, okay? That's not an extreme position. Here is the fact about a 20-week-old baby in the womb. That is a full baby, okay? There are babies who are now living outside the womb at 20 weeks. Outside the womb. If you see an ultrasound, we showed an ultrasound like uh, last week, I think, of what a 20-week-old baby looks like in the womb. It is a fully formed human child. 
Okay? There's a reason why, if you look over to Europe, it's so funny, the left is constantly talking about the wonders and glories of Europe. Europe is just this tremendous, wonderful, rich place of culture and happiness and open marriages. It's just so, they're so progressive over in Europe. Why can't we just be progressive like the Europeans? Here are the abortion on demand laws in various European countries. Greece, illegal past 12 weeks. Austria, illegal past 12 weeks. Germany, illegal past 12 weeks. France, illegal past 12 weeks. Italy, illegal past 12 weeks. Spain, illegal past 14 weeks. South Korea, abortion on demand is illegal totally. Ireland, illegal. Poland, illegal. Sweden, 18 weeks. Norway, 12 weeks. Denmark, 12 weeks. And so thanks to James Hansen, a contributor to The Federalist. Okay, the idea that, that Democrats are somehow in the mainstream when they vote down a bill, overwhelmingly, right? They vote, down, they vote in favor of killing babies after 20 weeks. That's an extreme position. And then they talk about how they want to protect all children like they're their own children. It's just sick, okay? Science does not support this. Science actively opposes this, or at least the facts would if we had any moral sense whatsoever. But, they, but they're so extreme that at the same time they're talking about how chain migration is a racist term, and they're talking about how Trump wants to make America white again by admitting 1.8 million illegal immigrants and another 4 million legal immigrants through chain migration. They're, they're saying that they're not extreme over, over the issue of abortion. By the way, the headlines on this have been ridiculous. It says Senate votes down Trump proposal to ban abortion after 20 weeks. The Senate didn't vote down anything. The bill would have passed 51 votes. It had 51. Only two Republicans voted against it. A couple of Democrats voted for it. Okay, the, the fact is it would have passed except the Democrats filibustered it. So they actually used their filibuster power to ensure that women can still murder babies at 21 weeks in the womb. So very exciting stuff from Democrats. That's not their only extremism. Nancy Pelosi continues to suggest that tax cuts are a dark cloud. This is the language that she used. You know, it's funny. I remember not so long ago when there was a, which Republican was it who used the term dark? or said that, that it, was, it was a black period for the United States, and people suggested that that was racist. When then Nancy Pelosi says the tax cuts are a dark cloud, she says, the tax bill is really the dark cloud that hangs over the Capitol. Really? You know the tax bill that's, that's been boosting the stock market and causing people to get raises, that tax bill? The one that you called crumbs that's, being put in, that's putting thousands of dollars back in Americans' pockets? That tax bill? She says, they sell it as middle class tax cuts, but 86 million American middle class families will be paying more in taxes as a result of this bill. That is untrue. It's fundamentally untrue. Okay, there's no data to support that. The vast majority of American taxpayers will be receiving a tax cut. I'm one of the only people in America who won't be receiving a tax cut under this bill because I live in a stupid state called California. Okay, but she says this is what keeps her up at night, is the, is the tax cuts. So they're, they're against tax cuts. So here's what we know about the Democrats. They're against tax cuts. They're against limitations on migration because that would be racist. Any limitations on migration, by the way, would be racist, apparently. And they're in favor of people killing babies at 21 weeks. So, the, But they're not extreme at all. They're not extreme at all. The people who are really extreme are the Republicans. James Clyburn over at the Congressional Black Caucus, he says that right now the America we're living in is like Germany circa 1934. By the way, Germany circa 1934, for the historically illiterate, was the year after Hitler took power. It was during the Night of the Long Knives when Hitler literally sent his minions out to murder all of his political oppositions and consolidated all power in 1933 under the Enabling Act which basically made him a dictator. And James Clyburn says that's the United States right now, which makes perfect sense because James Clyburn right after this was stabbed to death by members of the Trump administration, except for not. Here's James Clyburn. I can only equate uh, one period of time with what we experience now. And that was what was going on in Germany around 1934, right after the 1932 elections when Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor. Uh, he began to do things to discredit the media, uh, to disrupt the judicial system. And uh, if you recall uh, from your studies, uh, they had swastikas hung in churches all over Germany. It's just like that, right? Because people have Trump flags hung in churches all over the United States, forcibly. And it's just like 1934 Germany. That's how radical the Democrats think the, the situation is. But they're the ones who are actually radical. One of the things that's amazing is how the media have covered for Democrats. So back in 2005, I mentioned this briefly on the show the other day. Back in 2005, there was a photo that was taken of Barack Obama and other members of the Congressional Black Caucus with Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan is an open anti-Semite. He is a brutal, vicious, racist anti-Semite. He's a piece of garbage, Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan, head of the Nation of Islam, and he was, a, he, he was visited, he visited an event hosted by the Congressional Black Caucus. Right? He, he has... He, I used to hang out with Keith Ellison, the, the, cam, the guy who campaigned for DNC chair. He was the backer of the Million Man March. Uh, he, he 
openly campaigned against particular opponents of, of Barack Obama's. You know, the fact that Louis Farrakhan was photographed among all these Democrats in 2005 and no one seems to care, it's amazing. Imagine if Republicans, House Republicans, had had a meeting in 2005 with David Duke. That's the equivalent here. The media covered all that up. The media covered all that up. And then James Clyburn says that this is like 1934 Germany. If it's like 1934 Germany, that's only in that the media are willing to overlook certain political proclivities on behalf of a, of a, of a particular political party. But otherwise, just, just insipid. Okay, in just a second, I want to talk a little bit more about sexual harassment, Me Too, because, and, and the State of the Union, of course. We'll get to that. But first, I want to say thank you to our sponsors over at Tripping.com. So, Tripping.com is the best way to travel. I was talking to my wife about this the other day. My wife and I recently, in the last few years, we've started vacationing in condos. When we go to visit someplace, we have a couple of kids now, and we need more space. It's not enough to stay in a hotel suite. We also need a kitchen because we keep kosher, so we like to cook for ourselves. Well, that means that we have to get a place that is not just a typical hotel room. And it turns out it's much nicer. You have a lot more room to spread out. It's like a home away from home. Well, that's what Tripping.com is for. They're the world's number one site for vacation rentals. They're trusted by millions of travelers, including the Shapiro family. With Tripping.com, one search lets you filter, compare, sort over 10 million available properties on trusted sites like VRBO, TripAdvisor, Booking.com, and more. You don't have to wonder if you're getting the best deal on that winter cabin or beachfront home. You'll save an average of 18% per night by booking your vacation with Tripping.com. So don't forget, if you want to save time and money while booking the perfect vacation rental for your next trip, head to Tripping.com slash Shapiro today. That's Tripping.com slash Shapiro. Again, Tripping.com slash Shapiro. That lets them know that we sent you. Also, it's just, it's fantastic. I'm, I'm telling you, you will enjoy your vacation more when you have room to spread out, when you have a washing machine, right? Like basic necessities that you miss when you're at a hotel. It's, it's, this is what Tripping.com is for, and it is just fantastic. So check it out, Tripping.com. Again, that's Tripping.com slash Shapiro. So go check it out and let them know that we sent you. Okay, so in just a second, we are going to talk about sexual harassment as well as State of the Union stuff, because we have a lot coming up uh, tonight. Actually, we are hosting a State of the Union party. But for all of that information, you're going to have to go over to DailyWire.com. So $9.99 a month gets you a subscription to DailyWire.com. When you get that subscription, you get the rest of our show live. You get the rest of Andrew Clavin's show live. You get the rest of, of uh, Michael Knowles, God help us, his show live. You get all of those, plus you get to be part of our mailbag. And if you get the annual subscription, then for $99 a year, you get all of that stuff, plus you get this. The greatest in all beverage vessels, the leftist tears, hot or cold mug. Now, when you get this tumbler, when you get this tumbler, I'm not saying that the power of my intelligence has been physically infused into the tumbler and you will gain 10 IQ points. I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen. But if it did happen, you shouldn't be all that surprised because we have been working on that process for quite a while here at Daily Wire offices. I'm good that. I'm refreshed now. I feel smarter. That's what this will do for you. So check that out. Also. Tonight, the State of the Union address, we're doing something I desperately don't want to do. We're going to live stream the whole thing. Yay! The president is going to speak to the nation in his second State of the Union address, really his first, technically. And you should watch us with us here at The Daily Wire, starting at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We'll be hanging out with you the entire interminable time, leading up to, during, after the address. It'll be absolutely terrible, and we'll be there for every terrible moment of it. Plus, we'll make fun of the Democrats' rebuttal. I mean, I'll make fun of the whole thing because, I mean, come on. I hate the State of the Union address. It's so stupid. So if we're going to have to suffer through it, suffer together with us. Enjoy the pain. Live the suck. It's going to be awful. Be there with us. Catch live streams at DailyWire.com, DailyWire Facebook, or DailyWire YouTube. And you can spend the evening with me, with Andrew Clavin, with Michael Knowles, and with Daily Wire God King Jeremy Boring. And we will comment on the address. We're going to mock each other. We will mock the government. We'll mock our political leaders. Uh, we'll mock our guests. There will be a couple of special guests who are dropping by, so check it out. Again, that is today, January 30th. 5 p.m. Pacific. I'm sacrificing for you. So damn it, if you're not here, I'm going to be mad, okay? You better show up. Because if I'm going to sit here and miss my evening with my children to watch this garbage, then you better be there to suffer with me. Come on. Misery loves company. Facebook and YouTube. And you can get notified when we go live if you subscribe over at dailywire.com. It's a party that you don't want to miss. Okay, check it out. Uh, or if you want to just listen to the podcast later, iTunes, SoundCloud, all of your usual podcast apps. Check that out. Subscribe over at YouTube. We are the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast in the nation. <laughs> In the lead up to the State of the Union address, uh, the Democrats continue to talk about sexual harassment uh, and sexual abuse and the Me Too moment. Now, the reason they keep doing this is because they figure the longer they keep this alive, let's say that in, in 2018, Democrats take the House. Good shot that happens, right? Rodney Freelinghuisen, who is a congressman from New Jersey in a, in a real battleground district, uh, he's the head of the House Appropriations Committee. He said that he's not going to run for re-election. The indicators, if he had to make a bet, you'd lay a bet that the, the Republicans lose the House. Uh, might be closer than, than you think it'll be, but... Uh, that, that's not a terrible bet at this point. 
Uh, so Democrats are hoping that in 2018, they take over the House and then they initiate a series of investigations and hearings about President Trump's proclivity for sexual abuse and harassment, allegedly. And that's what they want. So that's why they're keeping this alive. Well, yesterday, Kirsten Gillibrand, who wants to run for president in 2020, and she's really just a weak, terrible version of Hillary Clinton. Uh, she's not as good politically as Hillary Clinton, which is saying a lot. Uh, she's a bad liar, uh, which, is, which is a much worse liar than Hillary Clinton, which is saying a lot. She goes on The View. Again, we're playing all these clips from The View. Guys, where's my invite? I ask you again. Come on! Okay, so Joy Behar um, is, asking, uh, is asking Gillibrand about why she stood against Al Franken. She says, well, we have to put partisanship aside, and we really have to stand up against sexual abuse in all parties. And that's when Meghan McCain steps in. Now, Meghan McCain, it's really fascinating because Meghan and I used to be politically at odds. I think she used to be a little bit more left-wing and I probably used to be a little bit more abrasive, believe it or not. Uh, and, uh, and now, uh, I, I will say that Meghan has done a very good job on the view of representing an actual Republican position, which is something the view's been missing for a long time. Watch as Meghan McCain, with two simple questions, dismembers Kirsten Gillibrand on screen. It's amazing. I mean, these are not difficult questions to answer and they're not difficult questions to ask, but she has two simple questions and she, she turns Kristen Gillibrand, she reduces Kristen Gillibrand to a pile of rubble with two simple, straightforward questions. That is our job. Our right. job is to speak out, to say no to President Trump, to say it's not okay. We want accountability. Mm -hmm. We want transparency. We want Congress, specifically Republican leaders, to hold the hearings right. and have that transparency that we don't have today. Mm -hmm. right. I, I just want to move on because it is, there's some inconvenient truths on both sides. Reportedly, Hillary Clinton is under fire for covering up for a top advisor who was accused of sexual harassment back in 2007. She docked his pay and made him seek counseling, but allowed him to stay on. And women claim his harassment continued. You are a longtime supporter of the Clintons and consider her a mentor. Do you think her response this weekend was appropriate? Well, as you know, I think these things have to be dealt with, whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Republican, you need transparency and accountability, and no one is above criticism. Um, but in that case, I don't know all the details. <laughs> so she, suddenly, she, suddenly, she just is reduced to a quivering mass of I don't know. And then Meghan McCain follows up, and she asks her, okay, so, you know, you campaigned with the Clintons. Do you regret that? And Kirsten Gillibrand, again, has no answer, because all of this is partisan pandering. It's obvious it's partisan pandering. And how is Hillary Clinton not being raked over the, the coals today? It's insane. Clinton's campaign manager came out and she said, listen, I wanted to get rid of this guy. Right? I wanted to get rid of this guy inside Hillary Clinton's campaign, who uh, is her faith advisor, Bernd Strider, who is alleged to have sexually harassed the help. Right? And, and Hillary Clinton's campaign manager in 2008, Patty Solis Doyle, she says that she objected to this guy being on, on staff, Bernd Strider, and Hillary personally overruled her. So... Um... A young woman made a complaint to our head of operations about sexual harassment against Bern Strider, someone who's yes, Jess O'Connell, who's now the CEO of the DNC, uh, against Bern Strider, who she reported to. Uh, the incident was brought to my attention, and um, you know, I did my due diligence. I interviewed all the parties involved. I looked at the evidence. I looked at some emails that he had sent. I had looked at other documents. Uh, and came to the conclusion that uh, there was sexual harassment involved, that the young woman was very credible. Um, and my recommendation to uh, the senator uh, was to fire her. And I was overruled. She said she was directly overruled by Hillary Clinton. What about the Me Too moment? What about Hillary and the glass ceiling and standing up for women? Where are all the women who are talking about this? I'm glad this is on CNN. Like, I'm not going to pretend that the mainstream media hasn't covered it at all. But can you imagine? Can you imagine the hubbub if somebody inside, for example, the, the Ted Cruz campaign, his cam one of the people inside the Cruz campaign, had been accused of sexual harassment, and Cruz had just gone, well, no biggie. I'll block the firing. Right? All we'd hear about is men, evil men, scuzzy men, terrible men. But when Hillary Clinton does it, it's totally fine. And meanwhile, the, the weak needness of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the left on, on these issues is pretty astonishing. So Mark Ruffalo, uh, who is, is just a, a political leftist par, oxal, par excellence, and he was speaking out on AM to DM, which is, I guess, BuzzFeed's new show. Uh, and he says that, you know, all men have to, have to make a safe space in our privilege. See, that's the thing. When it, comes to, so when it comes to stopping sexual abuse and sexual harassment, it's really about men making a safe space in our privilege. I don't even know what that means, but... Apparently, you won't like Hulk when he's not angry. When you're privileged, um, 
you have a voice. Okay. And right now, men are privileged. Okay. They have a privilege over women, you know? It's just the way it is. And, um, and so we have to make a space inside of our privilege for, for, for a safe space for women to speak up. And I, and I, and I hope, uh, I'm hoping that more and more actors, men, uh, will do it. But they are, and there are ones that do. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, it's just we need more. What the hell is he talking about? Anybody know what he's talking about? And the idea that men are privileged over women in American society is absurd, okay? It is not true in the United States right now. There are many, many laws in place to protect women as well. There should be the idea that, that, Mark, that, that this is about men providing a safe space for women. Guess what? This is more about women actually seizing the space for themselves to tell their stories about how they've been sexually abused and harassed. And good for them for doing that. But what's funny is that Ruffalo won't be criticized for being patriarchal, even though what he's actually saying here is kind of patriarchal. He's saying, well, if we just back off, we, the men, we have to allow women to be free. Okay, women are free. It's a free and equal country. And women have the ability to speak out. And when they do, and they do so in productive ways, we should support them. We should also speak out when it turns out that people like Hillary Clinton are stomping on women who are complaining of being harassed. Okay, so time for some State of the Union talk. So tonight, the State of the Union, the stupidest institution in all of American politics. So let's be clear about this. It says in the Constitution, that the President of the United States, when requested by Congress, shall give, them a, 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 shall give them an update on the State of the Union. Okay, what that originally was is a letter. So George Washington used to send a letter to Congress. James Madison sent a letter to Congress. Thomas Jefferson sent a letter to Congress. Abraham Lincoln sent a letter to Congress. The idea of the State of the Union as this gigantic publicized event is actually a relatively modern invention. Uh, the idea that, that we need all this pomp and circumstance, we need to treat this as like the Oscars of politics, it's all annoying and irritating and stupid. And now we're gonna get all these celebrities who are gonna show up to, to do a counter State of the Union address. They're gonna do their own State of the Union address. The Democrats, I believe, are providing five counters to the State of the Union. There's Joe Kennedy, I believe Bernie's doing one, I think Maxine Waters is doing one. It'll be a cavalcade of stupidity and, and irresponsibility, so that'll be great. Also, as I say, a bunch of celebrities are, are doing their own. So Michael Moore tweeted out that he was going to, that, that there's going to be all of these people and this is 16, uh, there are going to be a bunch of celebrities who, who show up for this, uh, for this event. Uh, the People's State of the Union, right? It's going to be Common, Rufus Wainwright, Mark Ruffalo, Wanda Sykes, Rosie Perez, John Leguizamo, Cynthia Nixon, Kathy Najimy, Lee Daniels, and more. Because nothing says People's State of the Union like a bunch of multi-multi-millionaires who come out and talk about politics. Nothing says the State of the Union like a bunch of actors who haven't been relevant in 10 years except for Mark Ruffalo but they show up and have lots of money and talk about politics. I desperately want to hear what Wanda Sykes has to say. Uh, Kathy and Jimmy, I mean, I have just been wondering what the star of In Search of Dr. Seuss has to say about politics. I just don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm really turned on by this. It'll be, it'll be fantastic. The State of the Union address should not be publicly televised. Trump should just write a letter to Congress. We can all get on with our lives. Instead, we will sit here and suffer through it with you tonight. I hate it. I think it's stupid. I think Democrats and Republicans who pretend to like the president, it, it, it's just, it's all pretend and dumb. The, the, the routine that we have now where we all bring our favorite guests, and then we staff them up in the seats, in the, in the rafters. And then we say, oh, look, they're up in the, there's poor Jimmy, but poor Jimmy's been given a tax cut, and now poor Jimmy is rich. It's boring, it's trite, it's stupid, yuck. The dumbest one that I've seen about this, by the way, is apparently uh, there is some Democratic representative who invited a, a local state rep to show up, and the state rep, apparently, according to Politico, is literally going to stand, is going to sit there. I guess it's Paul Ryan's opponent. So Paul Ryan's opponent, Democratic opponent in his district, is supposed to show up to the State of the Union address. And according to Politico, this guy is literally going to sit there for the entire speech and stare at Paul Ryan. Like this is his plan, is to stare at Paul Ryan. Um, that's weird. That's weird. Also, tonight's gonna be really terrible because you know, the, all of the pretend unity is going, to, is going to just completely fall away. The Democrats are not going to cheer when they say the President of the United States, Donald Trump. They're all going to sit. There will be stony silence from half the chamber. And then every time Trump does stuff, I, I would not be surprised if there's some audible boos. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a Joe Wilson Uli moment. The whole event is insanely stupid. But it is a good time to evaluate whether this has been a great year for conservatives. So, as I've said before, I like a lot of what President Trump has done on policy. I like the tax cuts. I like his Middle East policy. I like his regulatory cuts. I like a lot of the things that I, I like his judicial picks. Mitch McConnell came out and said this has been the best year for conservatives in the last 30 years that he's been in Washington, D.C. 2017 was the best year for conservatives in the 30 years that I've been here. The best year mm -hmm. on all fronts. 
And a lot of people are shocked because we didn't know what we were getting with Donald Trump. He was doing fundraisers for Chuck Schumer three or four years ago. But this has turned out to be a very uh, solid, conservative, right of center, pro-business administration. And we're seeing the results of it. People who are right of center are very encouraged to see the results of the great work that was accomplished in 2017. Okay, so again, this, the, 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 there's a problem here. Okay, so it is true that a lot of the policy is good. It is also true that we have yet to see whether this was the best year for conservatives because you can't tell at the time, you can only tell in retrospect. If it turns out that Trump's toxicity is actually a problem for the conservative agenda, then all of the victories I talked about and celebrate, all of the things that I like about President Trump will actually redound against the agenda that I care about, which is why I beg President Trump nearly every day to stop being the character that he is being. And there's a story yesterday that President Trump, when, when Andrew McCabe, uh, when he fired James Comey, that James Comey was given a ride back on, on the FBI plane to D.C. And Trump called up Andrew McCabe, then the deputy FBI chief, and he said, why are you giving Comey a ride back? I fired him. And then McCabe said, well, I wanted to because I thought it was the classy thing to do. And then Trump said to McCabe, your wife's a loser. Right? That kind of stuff is not good for the president to say. So when we say that it's been a great year for conservatism, I can say it's been a great year for conservative policy. That I can say without any doubt and without any qualms. To say it's been a great year for conservatism, though, ignores that conservatism is a little bit more than just the policy. It is also the attitude of unifying America around a set of principles. And in that way, it has not been a good year for conservatives. OK, time for some things I like and some things that I hate. And then we'll deconstruct the culture briefly. So. Things that I like. Uh, yesterday, I recommended a book on Bach. Today, I'm recommending some music by Bach. Of course, if you've never heard Bach's Brandenburg Concertos, you probably have. You just don't know they're called the Brandenburg Concertos uh, the, or Concerti. The, the Brandenburg Concerto number one, this is all written about 1621. So this is very early music uh, from Bach. Uh, and the fact that, uh, and, and it is great. I mean, it's Baroque music. It's all great to listen to. It is great morning music. That's the nice thing about Bach. Bach, you can listen to at any time of day. I think he's the most listenable composer. Uh, Beethoven, you, you sort of have to be in the right mood. Uh, Mozart, you have to be in the right mood. Um, Brahms, you certainly have to be in the right mood. Bach, you can basically listen to it any time because there's great variety. Here's a little bit of Bach's Brandenburg Concerto Number 1. Okay, so it's glorious music. By the way, I got the date completely wrong here. It's 1721, not 1621. That'd be a little early 1621. Uh, so as I said before, you know, I, I talked yesterday about Mozart rediscovering Bach. I said it was like a 150-year gap. Of course, I screwed up the century. It was about a 50-year gap. Okay, time for a couple of things that I hate. All right, so thing that I hate, number one, first of all, Beyonce wore a dress to the Grammys that was supposedly so glorious. Everything about Beyonce is just glorious. She's just the most important person that has ever been or ever was. Uh, before the show, I was playing somebody, the SNL skit, The Bajency, which is just the best skit that SNL has ever done by a long shot, uh, in, which, in which Andrew Garfield plays a guy who says that he does not appreciate every piece of music that Beyonce has ever made, and then an agency literally comes to take him away. It's very funny. But Beyonce's dress that she wore was apparently inspired by the Black Panthers. This would be the second time that she's done something publicly in homage to the Black Panthers. Uh, the Black Panthers, of course, uh, were a violent terrorist group. And when I say a violent terrorist group, I mean they actually killed people. So David Horowitz, uh, my former employer over at David Horowitz Freedom Center, he actually used to work with the Black Panthers. He was a communist who worked with the Black Panthers. And he was working in San Francisco and knew a woman murdered by the Black Panthers. Here he is telling the story. And in December 1974, uh, uh, Betty disappeared. And by the time the police fished her body out of San Francisco Bay, I knew the Panthers had killed her. I, I had been interviewed by the police. They explained to me lots of things. It's very difficult to hide, to dispose of a body unless you have an organization. And then it's not so hard. You have safe houses and this and that. Um, and so when that happened, um, I was personally Devastated. Okay, and Horowitz ended up leaving the leftist movement because of the Black Panthers' extremism and terrorism. And yet now Beyonce pays homage to them, and we're supposed to pretend that she's some great racial unifier. That, of course, is silly. Okay, so um, you know we'll skip the other thing that I hate, even though it's pretty great, uh, and we'll get to a quick deconstructing the culture. So one of the movies that has actually been um, put up for best picture is the movie Get Out. It is really well made. Uh, it's very funny. It's very clever. Um, it's by Jordan Peele, uh, the comedian Jordan Peele. Uh, here's a little bit of the preview, and then I'll explain why, uh, wh what this says about American culture, this movie. 
You got your toothbrush. Check. You have your deodorant. Check. Do you have your cozy clothes? Got that. What? Do they know I'm black? Should they? You might wanna, you know? Mom and Dad, my black boyfriend will be coming up this weekend. I just don't want you to be shocked that he's a black man. <laughs> black. I ain't never seen you like this before, bro. Meeting family and taking road trips. Don't come back all bougie, man. Come back, get your pants up to your stomach. <laughs> So you guys coming up from the city? Yeah, we're just heading up for the weekend. Can I see your license, please? He wasn't driving. I didn't ask who was driving. I asked to see his ID. Call me Dean and you're hungry, my man. So how long has this been going on, this, this thing? <laughs> <laughs> we hired Georgina and Walter to help care for my parents. When they died, I couldn't bear to let them go. Okay, so the movie is, the movie is creepy. It's also really funny. Uh, it's really well made. Here is the problem with the movie. It is supremely racist, okay? So the problem with the movie is that the entire premise, okay, spoiler alert, the entire premise of the film is that this black guy has a white girlfriend. They go up and visit her white family up in some rich liberal area, and they're all Obama voters, but all of these black people uh, who are there are either staff or helpers, and they've legitimately been soul-sucked. Like, legit their, their life force has basically, their bodies have been taken over by white people, and they've been relegated to a small portion of their own brain. And the dying white people have now in, been infused into these black people's bodies, and their life force has been drained from them. They've basically been enslaved. The entire idea is a Stepford Wives idea. So Stepford Wives is an anti-man film, right? The entire film was about how traditional American culture sucks women dry and turns them into these, these replicants, these, these sort of weird android creatures, right? That's the entire premise of Stepford Wives. Well, Get Out is the same thing except with black people. The idea being that black people who associate with white people are eventually drawn into white lifestyles and they become, they, and they become uh, stereotypical white people. Right? That's the idea, that essentially white people want to enslave black people, and that the way that they enslave black people is by offering them nice houses and sex. Right? So Allison Williams, who plays his girlfriend, this loving girlfriend, this hot white chick, right? She, the, the, he, and they have lots of steamy sex in the film, but what she really wants out of him is to suck him dry of his blackness. That's the idea of Get Out. And the fact that liberal critics love this is indicative of the fact that they refuse to acknowledge that there is a racist undertone to this. There is, I'm sorry, there is. Now, there are people like Andrew Clavin who disagree. He says it was really just making fun of liberal white people. It is not making fun of liberal white people. The entire point of the film is that even the most liberal white people, even the ones who go out of their way to be tolerant on race, who go out of their way to say that they voted for Obama twice and would have voted a third time, it's a running joke in the movie. Even those people are seriously racist who just want to suck black people dry of their culture and history. That sort of concept would reverse the races, and everybody would, everybody would understand the serious problem with the racial politics in this movie. Again, it doesn't mean it's not well made. It doesn't mean it's an Oscar front runner because it, the more left you are in the Oscars, the better off. That means this and The Shape of Water are probably the two Oscar front runners. Um, Dunkirk will not win anything because it's not lefty enough. Um, but know that going into the movie. It's amazing to me that people have been willing to overlook this. So I will say what, what is the unsayable. I'll also let you know if Black Panther is good, by the way. Black Pan the reason I bring that up is because, as I said at the beginning of the show, the, the critics are just over the moon about Black Panthers. Number one, I don't like Marvel movies generally, so I think they're always wrong about Marvel movies. But second of all, we'll have to see if the movie's actually good or if it's getting the Wonder Woman effect, where it's not just the Wonder Woman is good, it's the greatest movie that's ever been made. It's, it goes something like this, Gone with the Wind, and then Wonder Woman's way up here, above Gone with the Wind. And we'll, we'll see if they do the same thing with Black Panther. I gotta admit, I was not blown away by the preview. I may be the only person in America who is not. I think Mathis agrees with me that the, that the trailer is overrated. We'll see, we'll see. But I may be the lone voice who's allowed to say that Black Panther wasn't as good as it, as, as it is cracked up. If it is good, by the way, I'll be really happy and I'll be glad to recommend it. So we'll let you know. All righty, we'll be back here tomorrow with a full recap of the very important, very fascinating State of the uh, Union address. Uh, we'll be back here tomorrow. We'll discuss all of it. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Mathis Glover, executive producer Jeremy Boring, senior producer Jonathan Hay. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.